Hi, my name is Charles, and I serve here at Transformation Church as one of the executive pastors. And I want to take a moment before we jump into the message just to say thank you, first of all, for watching. It means the world to us that you would be a part, no matter where you're watching from, no matter who you are. I'm believing that this message is going to encourage your faith and hopefully transform your life. If you haven't yet, make sure you take a moment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, not for us, but really for you. We wanna be a resource to encourage your faith and be with you on this journey of following Jesus. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the message today. I hope it blesses you. We are in a brand new series that we are calling Hot Girl Summer. Can y'all make some noise that we in week one and they said it's fun month and I need y'all to get ready, get ready, get ready, as Pastor T.D. Jakes might say. Y'all, we dropping into something that I, I love, not just because it's great marketing and you can put hot and, you know, you see the people posting where they kind of naked. I'm not talking about that kind of hot girl. Amen. Uh, hey, hey, we want to actually present, as we have four different ladies, four different voices of God, speak from a place of vulnerability. It doesn't take as much courage to uncover your body as it does to uncover your heart. I don't think you heard me. Many people uncover their body. Many people uncover their whole physique. There are few that dare to uncover their heart and vulnerability. I'm talking about being humble, open, and transparent. And the Lord is calling us beyond the fake Christianese of how you doing, blessed and highly flavored, to I'm actually dealing with some stuff that I might need a therapist to help me through. Today, and for every other week following this, you will have women of God to not speak from a place of where they've already arrived to. But we're going to speak from a place of where we're currently navigating. I say this all the time and I believe it with all my heart. The best message preached is the one you're currently living. He don't want you to just talk it. He wants you to walk it like you talk it. And he needs to have established the word in you as you get ready to encourage and challenge his people to go forward in the word of God. Anybody ready for some hot girl summer? It's about to go down. It's about to go down. Y'all, I'm excited. I brought my mama and my baby daddy with me. Can y'all give it up for my mama and my baby daddy? I heard we got a whole bunch of Forward Citizens in the room. Can y'all make some noise for Forward City Church? I got some Forward City people and some permission women in the room. Y'all can... Go ahead and take, well, don't take your seats because we're going to actually read the word real quick and then we're going to sit down. Can y'all stand for the reading of the word and then we'll, I, as my husband would say, y'all get to sit down and I get to stay up here and work. Amen. Let's turn to Genesis 45. Y'all, I'm excited. Anybody else excited about Jesus? I decided to follow him. No turning back. Wow. Genesis 45, we're going to read eight verses that are going to serve as a foundation and, a co and context for this life and this text, this, this life and this topic that I want to speak about that I really do believe is at the heart of so many Christians. The Bible, if, you, if you're there already, says this in Genesis 4, 45, 1 through 8. Joseph could stand it no longer. He could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, out all of you so he was along with his brothers when he told them who he was the bible says that he broke down and wept he wept so loudly that the egyptians could hear him and word of it quickly carried to pharaoh's palace i am joseph he said to his brothers is my father still alive but his brothers were speechless they were stunned to realize that joseph was standing there in front of them Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourself for selling me to this place. I want y'all to hear me and hear me clearly. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Somebody needs to tell somebody beside you, he sent me ahead. He said, don't even worry about it. It was Jesus doing. The famine, this famine that has ravaged the land for two years and will last five more years, are, um, and there will be no plowing and no harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many safe, um, 
preserve many survivors. Amen. So it was God who sent me here, not you. He's not going to let anybody get the credit for his story. He's not going to let anybody else get the credit for his story. And he is the one who made me advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of this entire palace and the governor of all of Egypt. Father, we pray in this room that you would add a blessing to the reading of your word. We understand, God, that without you, these are just words. But with your wind, God, I believe it has the power to break yokes. I believe it has the power to shift lives. I believe it has the power to do exactly what your will is. Father, I pray that you would move by your spirit. I am just a vessel. Use my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. Speak, God. Although we are in a room in a corporate gathering, I believe you can speak individually. Would you meet us right where we are? In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can take y'all seats. You can take your seats. You can take your seats. So for those of you that don't know me, y'all done let a country girl out of Georgia, from Sandersville, Georgia to be exact. And I am in Tulsa, Oklahoma for Hot Girl Summer. And I am absolutely excited about it. If you didn't hear my husband two weeks ago, we are a family with three children. Anybody a boy mom in the room? I am a boy mom. I, they should have a picture that they're going to show you of my amazing family. Those are my boys, and I love them. Pastor Travis and I are doing our best job. That's all I got. I'm telling you, these boys, they be working my nerves. They be running us crazy. And Charles, sometimes when we go travel a little bit, Y'all told me I could be hot, so I'm not going to give you the, oh, I love my children all the time sermon. Sometimes when I'm away from them, when I have been missing their hugs and their little smiles and their kisses, I might call the person watching them. Most of the time it's their grandma, and they're at their grandma's house. And when we get on the phone, all of a sudden this beautiful feeling of missing them turns into, y'all got to quit it. It cannot be that serious. Are you kidding me? Because if you're on FaceTime with my boys, especially them older two that um, are little, little, what we would like to not call is bad, but they, they something. That's all I got. They something. They be carrying on. That's how we say it in, in, in the country. They be carrying on. And one of the major topics that they carry on about, if you want to see it go down on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, choose whatever day of the week you want to in the green household. If the topic of first comes up, it's about to go down. I don't know if I got any other parentals in the room that knows that it's, I, I had it first, I want it first, it was mine, I came in first. It don't matter the actual topic of first. If the topic of first comes up, it's like, I want to sit by mommy first. I want to talk first. I want to read the book first. I want to lick the shoe first. They don't care what we're talking about. If first come up, they want to be first. And they get this bold conviction and this holy, righteous indignation, if you tell them they can't be first, that something's off. And I'm talking about Pastor Travis. We be over the drama, all the tears. Y'all, everybody going to get to go. But there's something about this fight for first that be getting on my last nerve. So I'll be like, you know what? Tell your grandma to get the phone. i call y'all later because this whole fight about first is just a lie. But if I'm honest, as I've been looking at my life and looking at some people around me, and as I look at my life in adulthood, I recognize that this fight for first doesn't start, doesn't stop in childhood. We find people fighting and, you know, pulling other people down and like crabs trying to get ahead of other people and knocking people off the ladder of success because there's still such a fight to get to first. Maybe it's the significance and the prestige and the lights and the camera and the actions that come along with being first that still shows up in our adulthood. Is there anybody in the room that's gonna be hot and let me know that you understand that you done seen some people fighting for first that ain't kids but grown? And I, I'm not mad at you. I, I've had my share first here and there. It is something beautiful about actually experiencing having worked really hard for something and reaching it. Do I got any first time graduates in the room? Maybe you the first to graduate, first to be promoted, first to experience something that you never experienced before. Maybe you know you one of them runners and you crossed the finish line first and you know they gave you the award. You know them 26.1 people. I don't know. It might not even be that level of running but I'm just saying there's some people that have experienced some first and it should be rightfully celebrated. But it's still this fight. It's still this thing that keeps showing up over and over again. And what I've recognized is that 
I don't want to leave anybody in the room out. That There are some people that have experienced this exhilarating feeling of first and having accomplished something first. But there are some other people that even as I'm starting this, they're already checking out. They're like, Dr. Jackie, I've never had the opportunity. I never had the exhilarating feeling of my name being called first, or me being able to get to the finish line first, or I never had this major accomplishment of getting to first. And I want you to know that I have not left you behind. You're in the right room. And if you're not in the right room, you're watching the right message. Because the first that I'm talking about, the one, if I'm being humble, open, and transparent, that I've been dealing with is a concept of first that has nothing to do with being born first. It has nothing to do with accomplishing something first. It has nothing to do with getting to that finish line first. I want to ask the question, what do you do when there is a first that finds you? One that you don't fight for, but that comes looking for you. Do I got any people that kind of know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a first that I wasn't looking for and somehow it showed up in my life. What What do you do? When first finds you, you feel like you're clothed in something that's bigger than you. You feel and you know that there's something on the inside of you that's different than everybody else. It's this specific thing that God has called you for. And I want everybody in the room that we all know that we all have a specific first. There's this thing that God has sent you to the earth to be an answer for that he's only called you to be first to do. There's nobody with the specificity and the uniqueness that God has placed on your life, and he wants to speak to those kind of people in the room. The Davids that was minding his business. He was good. He was tending to his sheep. I got anybody in the room like, y'all, I was chilling. Where did Transformation Nation opportunity come from? I was good. I went, Pastor Travis, he up here doing his thing, y'all. Like, hi, girl, Summer, like, are y'all kidding me? I was in the back of the line. I'm just the help. David taking care of his sheep. He's doing his thing and somehow first finds him. Jesse shows up to the house, to the house to anoint. And even though he wasn't called to the anointing ceremony, first went to the, to the pastures where the sheep were and said, yep, that one right there. He's been specifically assigned not just to be a shepherd boy, but to be a king. Do I got any people that know about first? Maybe you're like Mary and you are minding your business and God impregnated you with something. You are virgin just like everybody else. But he said, no, no, no. That one right up there in the bleachers, I want her to carry forth the king of glory. The angel of the Lord visits her. And he says, yeah, that one. I know everybody has a specific thing, but I want her to be the one. This was the situation with Joseph. When the Bible calls his name to be able to be sent ahead of his brothers into Egypt to do a thing that he was only ordained to do. Can I have some witnesses in the room that knows there is a first that will find you that you had nothing to do with that might be even out of the realm of your expertise, but God said, that one right there, we're going to go first. He wants us to know that he has assigned us to a lane that has been created only for us. So this kills this idea of comparison. Can't nobody do it like God wants to do it through you. He's calling you, baby, to stand up and be exactly what he said for you to be. You watching online. Yeah, he's calling you too. He's saying, stand up and be who I created you to be. Nobody's going to do it the way I want to do it through you. First, we'll find you. And he's wanting to know if there's anybody in the room that'll stop fighting about this reality that you weren't fighting for and just agree with the fact that he decided about you. He decided to give you the leadership abilities that you have. He decided to call you differently than he called anybody else in your family. He decided, and he's asking today, will you agree with heaven with what he decided? Will you agree? So often, we're just mad about that he called us. And he said, I called you because I trusted you. Many people are fighting for a thing that I can't trust them with. He wants the ones that can be trusted because he decided about them before time began. Romans 12, 9 says this thing in a way that I love. It was real simple. And sometimes we need to slow it down because I want you to know I have biblical context and proof for this idea that all of us have a specific thing we've been called to be first in. This is what the Bible says. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Stop saying that you're not good at that. 
Stop saying, oh, that's nothing. God said that he created you with a specific gift to do that thing well. Ain't nobody going to sit on this stage like Charles Metcalf and read that Bible and blow our mind. Nobody. There's nobody like Bree that's going to help us understand about being still and having Sabbath rest like Bree will. I want you to know that God will call you and he will specify you with something that you do differently than anybody else. Charles' wife, Abby, nobody prophesies like her. Nobody will bring you into a place like Jay and help you feel like you're welcome like nobody else. She has eyes. Y'all, I was asking Jay for lashes and shoes. Like, she do it like nobody else can do it. And I'm saying, this is what the Word of God says. He says that he gave us different gifts to do certain things well. So if God has given you an ability to prophesy, he says, speak out with as much faith as you have been given. If you've been given a gift to serve, he says, serve them well. Stop saying you're not good at it. Agree with God. If you are a teacher, he says, teach well. If your gift is encouraging others, be encouraging. That's what I'm doing. Y'all, I like to encourage people to see themselves the way God sees them. I like to encourage people to stop saying you're not and believe your height. I've been anointed to unlock the hidden treasure on the inside of people. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And if he said, and he called me to it, I'm going to agree with heaven. I'm going to do it with all my might. Watch me work. Huh? Watch me work. And I'm saying, he want to watch you work too. He says, if he called you to speak, speak. If he called you into encourage, encourage. If he called you to give, give generously. Y'all, they're telling me to wipe my face. I'm trying. Amen. Y'all, I get real rowdy. It's over here. It's over here. Amen. Okay. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. He says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. There is a specific type of verse that God is calling us to. And I think with a gentle affirming voice, God is asking us to own our lane, to be sent ahead in the thing that only he can do through you. Can I tell you something that God shared with me prophetically? He says, there have been some people in the earth looking for answers that already exist. He says, the issue is not on me, Jackie. I've already given the answers, but my answers are hiding. And the earth is waiting for the true sons and daughters to finally get the courage to be revealed. With the true sons and daughters of God, please stand up. When are you going to agree with what he said? When are you going to own the right to be only who he created you to be? He sent you ahead. Just like Joseph, he's sending you first. I asked the Bible questions. I asked Jesus questions. I said, Jesus, we're clear that you want us to rise up. We're clear that you want to do something in us that we haven't fully agreed with. And okay, God, but why actually is it so hard? If it's what we were made to do, if we were made to prophesy or to teach or to speak, God, why is it so hard? Do I got any people in the room that's been sent first and like, God, I've been trying, but it's hard. That's been my story. Daddy, I know you've been calling me a long time, but it's been way more comfortable to hang in the background. It's been way more comfortable to say, oh, I just worship and pray. I don't speak. And God says, says who? He says, that when we start looking at this idea of first, there's a flip side to this coin called first. And he says, my children, the reason they're having a hard time is because they don't like the flip side to first. They see us post the pictures on Instagram of the ribbon cutting, y'all, but they don't read the fine, pit, the fine print at the bottom of the picture. They don't know that all those people celebrating with us, many of them weren't there. They weren't there on the hard days. They weren't there on the days where we were doubting. They weren't there on the days where we were, God, am I crazy? They see us run the marathon. They see us get to the finish line, but they can't testify like Jesus how many times we tried to turn back? How many times we tried to give up? How many times we said, God, take this mantle because it's too much. I'm talking about the flip side, the first. Many people see the lights, the camera, the action. 
They see the glamour and the glitz, the shiny part of the coin of first. But if you flip that thing over, inscribed on the back of first is the cost of first. I'm talking about there's pain that comes along with first. And that's the topic of our discussion today. The pain of first. The pain of first. I know it shines on one side, but there's a cost on the back. The pain of first. They don't know what you had to get through to, to, to post that picture. The pain of first. They don't understand that it's more to it than what they see on these bright lights and stages. The pain of first. And he's saying that if we're going to get to the place where we're going to be in agreement with being sent ahead, we're going to have to get some revelation and some perspective shifts in, even some healing for some pain that we've had to live through in order to go to our next place of first. Do I got any people in the room with me? The pain of first. So we're going to look at Joseph's story. And in his story, we're going to see after looking through about 13, 13 chapters, it's Genesis 37 through 50 of how he had to manage and learn to deal with this idea of being sent ahead of everybody else. This idea of difference. Inside of his story, just to give those that may not know Joseph a little context, this is a guy that was born to one of our major patriarchs, Jacob. And from the time he was born, he was favored. He was given a coat. His brothers hated him for the coat. And they hated him for the dream that God gave him. After they, get, after they hated him for the dream and the coat, they stripped him of the coat. They caused him to be sold into slavery. And after being sold into slavery, he ends up in a place called Egypt where he goes through a journey of prison and the palace. And from the palace to the prison. And he arrives at the place that God has called first. And we're going to look through this whole story, this whole journey of how J how Joseph continued to choose to be sent ahead irrespective of the pain that came with it and God is going to give us perspective on how we can look at the three major pains that generally stop us slow us down and make us back into a corner and not stand up in the thing that God has called us for the pain called first the first thing that Joseph encounters it is pain of being rejected and misunderstood I believe there's some people in the room that understand that there are times like, jo like Joseph, you were just born with a favor and a coat on you that you don't even fully understand and you don't really know. And somehow, after being given a dream and a vision that you didn't give yourself, people don't like you. Can y'all help me with that? You've been given a dream, you've been given a favor that you don't quite understand, and all of a sudden, they mad at you for something that you don't even fully understand. All I'm saying is it made me feel like the times y'all know when mamas gave you whoopings and they put you in a whooping line and you don't know why you're getting a whooping. I'm saying, if you're going to whoop me, let me be the showed out and know I showed out. If you're going to be mad at me. That's how the people that are sent first feel. We feel beat on and critiqued and beat down and misunderstood and rejected because you don't, we don't even understand why you mad at us for something we didn't give ourselves. I'm talking about the pain of being misunderstood and rejected. I had this experience in my life where I was a young girl. I didn't have language, but I knew that I love people really deeply. And I knew that I was always named the queen of my daycare, middle school, high school. I mean, you named the school and they made me queen of it. I didn't get it. It was this thing that was on me. Y'all, how you be the queen of your daycare? I'm just saying it was put on me. I didn't ask for it. The school was called Appleton and I was there. And I recognized that people really had a hard time with actually embracing me fully. I asked my mom one time and I said, Mama, like, I really love these people. And like, I'm trying to show up. I'm trying to do everything that they need to be done. But why do they treat me like this? Why don't they love me the way I love them? I really, really love them. I got any people that got a heart to really love folks and been hurt, the same thing that was a gift sometimes feel like a curse. I was dealing with it, and this revelation came to me because I was talking to my therapist on betterhelp.com. If you don't got a therapist, I actually really got to give a shout out to Pastor Mike and Pastor Natalie because I would have never got a therapist because I thought I was good. I was fine. And Jesus was like, baby, go and take that. So we're having a conversation. 
we having a conversation and she told me about myself, y'all. I believe in some people in here like me. She said, you have to look and look for cracks in people like you. You know, them church people that, you know, we best and highly favored of the Lord. You have to look for these little cracks that happen because you're all good because you've learned and you taught yourself all these things. But if you start digging a little bit deeper, you'll find stuff that you didn't know was there. I'm talking about pain that came that you didn't ask for because of things that you didn't ask for. That's what happened. We're on this, we're having this conversation and... My therapist, she was like, Jackie, like, what makes you special? You know, the whole therapy stuff. I was like, you know, these things. Like, I'm a leader. I love people, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, yeah, okay. So why has it been so hard for you to be who you've been created to be? Oh, oh, baby, you don't have to come for me like that. I started crying. And I was like, what is this? So in the middle of my tears, I started hearing something that my mom used to say to comfort me with my difference. And although it was meant to comfort me, it also meant that it made me hate and have to wrestle with the difference that she was trying to comfort me with. These words that on one side might be like, okay, I get it, also make me feel like, dang God. She said, Jackie, people love you the best they know how. They love you the best. I didn't ask for this. I didn't do nothing. What you mean? You love me the best you know how. I was in a place where I was just trying to love people. And as I listened to those words, what I actually heard was, don't be sad that it's hard to love somebody like you. Like me. I didn't ask to be the leader. I didn't ask to, to love people the way I, I love people. I didn't ask to be who I am. But God saw fit to call me first. And God saw fit to call you first. And so in the middle of them disliking the way I was made up, it actually in turn made me hate the way I was made up. And for a long time, in order to not feel the pain of mis being misunderstood and rejection, what I did was I dummied down and I conformed and I said, you know what? I'll just tuck away the favor that's on my life and I'll tuck away the leadership and I'll tuck away the love so that I won't be hurt by the pain of being misunderstood again. But what happens is when you do something for a long time, it's hard to recover to be the authentic person that you've been created in the lane of first to be. I've been recovering for a long time of trying to be somebody that they didn't like that God created me to be. And I'm saying that the sons and daughters just like me are gonna stand back up in who you were actually created to be from the beginning. They can like it or not like it. I'm gonna be what he said. They can like it or not. What's the option? Settle and not get and be who God called you to be or be likable. I'd rather be misunderstood and rejected. They rejected my Jesus and he was still powerful. They rejected Martin Luther King who had a dream and he was still effective. You can take this whole world. Just give me Jesus. The pain of being rejected and misunderstood. And God said he had some things that he wanted to say back to those people that have dealt with this pain of being rejected and being misunderstood. He says he wants you to understand first that this favor that's on your life, it's not haphazard or accidental. Just like Joseph, the favor was intentional for positioning. It was necessary for the call that he had on your life. It wasn't haphazard. And then he said that many times we look at the favor on our life and we take it for granted because we think it was given by man. Joseph was only an instrument of Jesus to see what God had already ordained. Uh, Jacob was only an instrument of Jesus to see what God had already ordained about Joseph. He was just used like the teacher that kept saying, girl, there's something in you and pushing you a little bit harder. Just used like the boss that keeps promoting you without the credentials. They can be used, but the favor doesn't originate with them. Psalms 84 and 11 says this, that it is the Lord that bestows honor and favor. And I need you to know, don't take casually the favor that's on your life because it was given by Jesus. He says that there are times when we're looking at this dream, this vision, this assignment, and we keep dummying down and backing up because we feel like, I don't want people to think I'm thirsty. I don't want people to, I don't care what people think. The dream and the assignment wasn't given by you. That dream that Joseph had was given by Jesus. It was what he desired. Paul said it like this. It was by the will of the Lord that I became an apostle. This thing that I'm standing in, 
I didn't ask for it. It was the will of the Lord. That thing you're standing in, it was by the will of the Lord. You don't have to apologize anymore for something you didn't give yourself. I need to speak to the heart of a man and a woman in this room, a man and a woman watching online. You didn't give yourself that dream and that vision to eradicate sex trafficking. You didn't give yourself the dream and vision to rise in leadership. You didn't give yourself the assignment to stand and be the yoke breaker in your family. Jesus did it. It was his delight and his desire. It was his delight and his desire. So in order for us to get the ability to walk forward in health, we're going to have to adopt some language that I'm not telling you to say out loud. You might have to say it in the mirror sometimes when you start feeling some type of way and you feel like you're going to back up. You're going to have to say sorry, not sorry. Did you hear me? There's going to be some times where you go to the family reunion and they acting crazy. You're going to have to be like, sorry, not sorry. I'm going to be who God said. I'm not backing down. I'm not backing up because I did that long enough and I got the results you got. But I want something different. And if I go, maybe you might go too misunderstand and reject me but give me Jesus I'm gonna do what he said I'm gonna do what he said somebody say it I'm gonna do what he said Woo. give me Jesus the last thing God dropped on me y'all it's gonna help you transformation nation because y'all have y'all have sat in this place a lot the Lord said we expect way too much of people. The reason we've been dealing with so much pain and so much unrest with their misunderstanding and their rejection is because we expect too much of people. I started thinking about Transformation Nation story, y'all. How you go from being a sound man turned music director, turn youth pastor, turn the senior leader of a church in just four years because a faithful couple called Bishop Gary McIntosh and Debbie decide we're not going to hold up the oil that God wants to send forward. How they, where they do that at? We can't hold it up. We're going to pass forward the thing that God has wanted to send ahead. And you want people to understand something that it's taking you 32 years to wrap your mind around. God said, give them some grace. It's too mighty for them to understand because my ways are not their ways, nor my thoughts their thoughts. And as far as the heavens are higher above the earth, so are my ways. How you go from 1519, a grocery store to an arena in Bigsby? We're not even going to talk about the towers. You're expecting too much. God said, give them grace. Give them grace. Don't ask them to understand something that's too lofty to be understood. They call it just being sent ahead. The next time they question you online transformation, tell them it's just my first. I'm just being sent ahead. I know you can't understand it because he didn't give you the dream, but this is our first and we're going to stand up in it. Misunderstand me. Reject me. But I'm going to be transformation nation. Transformation, please stand up. The pain of first. The pain of first. Y'all, I got to speed up. That first one hit me heavy. They didn't understand Joseph. So they rejected him. They stripped him of his coat. 17-year-old boy. They took all that he had ever known to be normal. They stripped him. They plotted to kill him. In the end, they resolved to just sell him. And it landed him in a place that is the topic of our next pain. They landed him in Egypt, the place of newness. Does anybody know about the pain of newness? I know y'all shouting about it. You be like, on New Year's, give me Jesus and give me all things new. We sing the songs. Everything new, everything new, everything new. And when Jesus starts trying to do something new, you lose your mind. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you messing with me? I was fine. We sing the song, but what I'm recognizing is that we actually love old way more than we like new. We like our old habits. 
We like the way we've always done it. You know they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But the people that would be willing to be sent first have to say, God, break it because I know you want to do something new. It's a new language in the place of first. He says we don't like our old victories. I mean, he said we love our old victories and we don't like to have to work for new ones because it'll require new faith. To get new dominion and new territory, you're going to have to live through the pain of producing new faith. And as we are looking at this story, God is inviting us to separate from what might have been old to walk into a place of newness just like Joseph was willing to do. Can I tell you a personal story about my place of newness? I'm going to need my white coat. Mm. My God. The pain of first. One of the hardest places of newness for me was when I went to dental school. get me right so I got my clean white coat and on one side it looks amazing and people are like oh you a doctor they don't know what I lived through to put this white coat on God shifted everything about my life prior to going to dental school all I knew was a life of looking the part but never actually being good on the inside all I knew was a life of perfection and crossing every T and dotting every I because in professiondom, this is what they teach you that you have to do. God was like, I'm about to give you some new language. And I tried, y'all, I tried to Christianize my way into staying. And God said, baby, I'm telling you that you've been calling success when you get a certain outcome. What if I tell you success has nothing to do with the outcome you get? Can I tell you what I call success? He says, Turn with me to Joshua 1. He says that if you will meditate on my word and not deviate from it and actually obey my instructions, you will be prosperous and very successful if you will obey my instructions. So could it be that the success that I was looking for was actually tied to my obedience? As I got this white coat, he rearranged my life for me to see myself differently. He gave me a new language and he changed me into a brand new person by forcing me to live a brand new way. I learned not to lean to my own understanding. I learned to acknowledge him. I learned to let go of my own abilities to get abilities that are greater than mine. Do anybody know that he is stronger and more mighty than we could ever be? He has wisdom and knowledge that is more amazing than we've ever imagined. What I don't like about this land of newness though y'all is it never stops being new you'll wear this coat and it'll feel good for a while but do you know what actually happens to a coat that you wear for a long time it becomes old and it'll it'll create the ability for you to stop depending on God and for you to just put your pride and your your identity and your strength in the thing that you've been wearing and God in his sovereignty and his love for us will require the thing that you've been clothed in What happens when God in one season says, yes, your first looks like becoming the first dentist in your family. But in the next season, I want you to give me that because I need some now faith. Is, there, is it possible that we're in this room today where you might be wearing a coat that still works and still fits well. But God is saying that although it fits, it's not final. I just want to know, are there some people in the room that might be putting on something that he gave you. I'm not saying you made it up. I'm saying that he might want to do something more. He might want to progress you a little bit more and he might have to take your old coat to do it. There is this pain attached to newness. In one season, Joseph was the boy who was fine in the coat of being Jacob and Rachel's favorite fit. And then it moved from that coat to being part of a slave. And it moved from that coat to being a prisoner. And then moved from that coat to being the second in command. But God says if he wouldn't have taken off those coats, he would have never got to the place of being second in command. I wonder, has there been people in the room showing up to the right place but with the wrong coat on? 
you so stuck in what worked in the past season. And God is saying, I know that worked in the last season, but I want to do something new. Will you be willing to pause with me today and ask God to maybe strip us, to take back off of us what is now become old so that he can put the new back on so we can stand up fully in it and progress into the place that he wants to take us. Can I have my pink coat back? Because I believe that God is, by representation, showing us that we don't have to stuck, stay stuck with our identity being limited to this. There are moments when you attach your identity so tight to this that if I showed up into this room actually wanting to do heart surgery, but I look like a dental surgeon, I limited myself. I put on a coat that in one season, it fulfilled its purpose, but in the next season, it started to limit me. Are you in the right room with the wrong coat on? Have you attached your identity too tightly to a thing that God is trying to free you by taking it off? See it in the spirit. See him stripping you of every old coat, of every limitation. See it. And yeah, this new coat might be a little tight today. I might have to kind of get it right, you know, get used to wearing it. But baby, if you call me to it, I'll let go of everything old. I'll walk boldly in the new thing. This was Joseph. God on the mountaintop or the valley low, I'm going to trust you. In the palace or the pit, I'm going to trust you. If I have to take a few exercises to get used to the newness, I'm going to trust you. He will deepen our will of trust in order to progress us to a place where we really know who we've been created to be. Joseph, trust God through the pain of being a prisoner and a slave and being rejected and being abandoned all the way to the place where he finds himself progress to second in command. This happens by way of him choosing to give, use the gift that God had given him. He interprets the dream of the Pharaoh. And as a result, he's giving the, the, the privilege of being able to devise a plan to be able to save not just the Egyptians, but all the surrounding areas that were, being deal, that were dealing with famine. It was in this place that his 11 brothers who had once sold him 22 years ago are drawn out. He's in this place of newness. And God does something that can be very painful. We drop into our text of Genesis 45 right at this moment where Joseph, after a, a, a series of events, are sitting at, he's sitting at a table with all his brothers and God says, live through the pain of owning who you really are. This is our last and final pain. It might be the hardest. Where you go back to a people that you feel like should have known you better than anybody. You've already had to live through being misunderstood by man and, and the world and being rejected by man. And you got to deal with being misunderstood and not known by your family. This is Joseph. And he's seated at this table. And as we look at this text, the Bible says that Joseph said, hey, attendance, this ain't got nothing to do with y'all. This is personal. Joseph says, I'm about to get really hot, humble, open, and transparent. And he cries out, the Bible says in verse 2, that he wept through tears. And he says, I am Joseph. I'm Joseph. I didn't call myself what the Egyptians called me. I didn't, I didn't call myself a label of being the advisor of the king of Egypt. I didn't call myself the pain of yesterday. I call myself what Jesus said about me. I am Joseph. And you might have to go back to a place that marked you with pain, that knew you by your nickname. And you might have to stand up and say, I'm not that. I am Joseph. In a place where I might have doubted, I had to stand tall and say, transformation, they're going to get Jackie. 
I'm not Charles. I'm not Bree. I'm not Travis. I'm not Mike. I'm not Natalie. I am Jackie. And it's enough. You reintroduce yourself to let them know that without your understanding of who you are and Jesus' narrative, that what they meant for evil, God was working it all for good. You'd never be able to say it with 10 toes down. I'm Joseph. Maybe you're in this room and all you can think about in a moment like this is the man that left. Left you with those kids. And all you've been saying is, I'm single mama. I'm hopeless. I'm desperate. I don't have enough. I need you, even if you don't post it on social media yet, even if you're just getting used to standing back up in the mirror and saying it to yourself, I'm Sarah, I'm not a divorcee, I'm not just a single mama, I'm what God says. I'm not just the broken one or the person dealing with unforgiveness because of what they did to me. I'm not my pain. Eric, I know you messed up on your wife. But you're not an adulterer. That's not what God calls you. You need to get back in the mirror, man of God, and say, I am Eric. You need to say what heaven says about you. Because I believe in the moment where we're brave enough to reintroduce ourselves by owning our real identity, we'll be able to forgive the people that mistook us. We'll be able to forgive the people that rejected us. We'll be able to forgive the people that led us to an unknown place. Because we'll see that in the middle of pain, packaged inside of the pain of first, was a kingdom call of promise. I am Joseph. Can we stand in this room by symbol of standing? We're standing back up to say, I'm not what happened. I'm not what they did to me. I'm not what they tried to take. I am Joseph. I know it hurt. And God wanted to address the pain today. But he gave you a new name. He gave me a new name. You are son. You are daughter. You are chosen. You are not forgotten. You are exactly the way he wants you. No regret. You're not your pain and you're not your past. You get to stand with now faith in the present and believe what God says about you now. To trust Him now. I believe there are people in this room that may want to get to know this God that can give you a new name. I believe there's some people that said, I've been trying it on my own long enough and I've been rejected and abandoned and I've been in a foreign place and I don't know how to stand up and own who I've been created to be. But maybe if I can get closer to a Savior that knows me, I can own who He created me to be. If you're in this room and you want to give your life for the first time or for the first time in a long time to the Jesus that knows who you really are, just by show of hands on the count of three, I want you to raise your hands. One, two, three. I see hands already. I see hands already. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices. All of heaven rejoices when one comes back to the Father. I believe we're owning our identity again. Come on. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You gave me a new name. You gave me a new name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I was an orphan. I put your name on it. You put your name on me. I was a label. No identity. I put your name on it. You put your name on me. I was a sinner. I was a sinner. But it was over. I put your name on it. You put your name on me. You put your name on me. I was a label. Would you just put your hands back up? And if you see somebody with their hands up, would you just be so generous to place your hands on them as a sign of agreement?
there's some people taking their identity back because of choosing to give their life to the one that created them in the beginning. Can you all repeat after me? Lord Jesus, let's say it all together. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And thank you for getting up so I don't have to stay down. I confess you as the Lord of my life. And I give you permission to have your way in Jesus' name. Somebody give God some glory in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Before anybody leaves this building, it's really important in this moment that I tell anybody that made the decision to give their life to the Lord for the first time or the first time in a long time to take say to the number 82. 8282 Transformation Nation would love to see you resources and partner with you on this new journey that you're starting and living through the pain of first and to being who God created you to be. I want you to know that God has been with us in week one of Hot Girl Summer. Go out and live a transformed life in Jesus' name. They want it. You put your name on you put your name Hey, I want to take a moment again before we jump off and say thank you. Our church is not built on one individual, but on the sacrifice of so many. And you being a part, it means the world. So thanks for watching the message. I also want to say thank you to the thousands of people around the world who are generous. It means the world and we are able to represent, we're able to be generous to meet the needs of people because of your giving. If you haven't taken the step to give, trust me, there is no pressure at all. But if you feel led, you can text the word GIVE to 828282 82 or you can go online. When we partner together, God uses our generosity to make a difference. Again, if you haven't, take a moment to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And more than watch it on YouTube, join us on Sundays. Every single Sunday we're here, 1045 CST AM. We would love to see you. And like we always say, go out and live a transformed life.